Well, welcome back. I'm glad you're with us as we continue our walk through the Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 33 today. And this is another one which is misunderstood at times and other times explained away. So let's have a look. Again, you've heard it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. I don't see any problem with that so far, do you? Don't break your oath. If you've made an oath to God, don't break it. But Jesus wants us to go deeper. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Well, what's going on here? I've had people say, well, this means that you can never take an oath. An oath of office, um, an oath to go into military service, an oath to testify in a court. Uh, in the American courts, they would, they would come up and they still make you swear an oath, but they, they used to make you put a hand on the Bible and raise another hand. The Bible's gone in almost every court now in the West. Uh, they would say, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Uh, or in some, by the, to the best of your ability. You know, they, somewhere there's the word swear, and people who were in my tradition growing up would say, I solemnly affirm. Now, the fact was, we were making affirm a synonym of swear. It had no functional difference at all. But we thought, well, we can't swear. So we will affirm. Uh, I, I know of a, at least one man who, at the end of the reading of the oath to him, said, I'm a Christian and I'm aware of the laws of perjury in this state. He wouldn't even say affirm. I think they are overreading this. And they're not getting it. Jesus is, uh, by the way, this was a problem. It really was a problem. Josephus tells us some about this in his writings. You can get those for free on the internet or you can buy them. They've been out of copyright about 2,000 years. So you can buy a huge book for just a few dollars. It is incredibly boring unless you really like reading ancient history. Um, and if you do, then it's actually pretty cool. Uh, there are sections of it still going to try your, uh, your insomnia out, I think. It's going to put you down. But regardless, there were the Pharisees in particular, and some of the Sadducees as well, would swear, you know, I swear an oath on the temple. But then when they didn't do it, you'd say, wait, you didn't do it. I didn't swear by the gold on the altar. You know, they always try to say, I didn't. it wasn't a big swear. It was a lesser swear. So Jesus is saying, not by heaven, not by earth, not by Jerusalem, not by anything. But learn to be a person that when you say yes, you mean yes. When you say no, you mean no. And don't go further. Because as soon as you do, he says, that gives an open door to the evil one. We call it the devil. We'll call it Satan. But it opens up the door to places you don't want to go. So, do I swear when I go to court or the like? Yes, because I know what they mean. They mean tell the truth. And so that's all that word means. I'm going to tell the truth. Uh, at least the truth as I know it. I'm going to tell the truth. With uh, oath of office, I've never had to take one of those, you know, going into the military. Go ahead and put your hand up. Go ahead and swear. Because you are just saying, I understand the oath and I accept the terms of the oath. You're saying yes to the oath. And if you just try to get around it by saying, I affirm or the like, you're doing the same thing. But in our regular everyday life, just be a person of your word. If you say you're going to be there, you're there. If you say you're going to go do this, you do it. And if later you find out you, you messed it up, you apologize. I've messed it up royally. I think one of the worst times ever was I was in Michigan and got a call from Columbus, Ohio, four hours away by road. And they said, 
where are you? You're up in 30 minutes. And I said, no, I'm not. And they said, yes, you are. And I was completely in the wrong. I had filed that speaking date. This is back before we had iPhones doing everything for us. Filed that speaking date in a folder in the wrong month. And I was supposed to be speaking and I wasn't there. I apologized and I asked them to invite me back to the next seminar the next year. And I said, I'll come on one condition. Don't pay me a penny. And they're going, oh, no, we understand. I said, no, do not pay me a penny. I need to make up for this because I made a vow and I broke it. So we own up to it when we do it. And we try to make it right the best we can. Sometimes you can't, you can't fix everything that's broken, but you try. But keep everything simple. I don't know how many times in the life of a police officer, they will have, they will have people say, you have to believe me. <laughs> no, they don't. They, you have to believe me, I swear. No. Well, I swear to God. No, I swear on my mother. We don't even know your mother. No, we don't have to believe you. Live the kind of life, though, that when you say this or that, people can believe you because you keep your word. You keep your promises. Be that person. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, if this helps, let me give you a completely fictional scenario. All right? Let's say that I don't like broccoli because broccoli is one of the hated vegetables. You know, it's not cauliflower, which is the worst. You, we only eat cauliflower if it's hidden, but in many three cheeses or something. And I'm, by the way, I'm going to get emails now. What do you have against cauliflower? Looks like a human brain. It just looks wrong. It looks, anyway, I like broccoli. But let's say I didn't. And let's say that I have brought that up to Cammy. Now, I'm not being sexist here. The fact is, my wife and I have different skills. I cannot make dinner at all. I can make a burnt offering. And then we can all wave hello to the firemen when they show up. But I cannot make food. I can make reservations. That's the best I can do. She can make food and makes it brilliantly. And so you know, I do the cleanup after. I, I have my chores to show her appreciation. So we're not being sexist here. When I sit down at the table, she's made the meal. And there's stuff in there I like. And there's broccoli. And we've had this talk. And she looks at me with her sweet face. And she goes, how do you like your meal? I can say, thank you for making me a meal. Thank you for making me a healthy meal. You must want, want to keep me around and just smile at her. And she smiled back and the evening's a good one. What if I decide to go further? Don't. If I said, but there's broccoli. You know I don't like broccoli. Mm. Didn't need to go there. What if I go further? You know I don't like broccoli. You're just like your mother. Oh my goodness. What just, I kicked open every door and said, come on demons, have your way with this. You don't need to say things. I had a friend, and by the way, I've told him I talk about him all the time. He thinks it's funny. So I had a friend come across from Scotland when we'd only been back in, in, in the country for a year and perhaps uh, and he, he, he landed at the airport. This is back in the days where you used to be able to go greet them off the airplane. I know, what a weird world that was, eh? Uh, he comes off, and, and I said, how, how are you doing there, Albert? Albert? And he goes, doing fine. And I said, how was your flight? And he goes, it, it was fine. Do you, do you like British Airways better than Delta? And I said, I, I haven't really thought about it, Albert. And that set the tone. As we go out to the car, uh, he hops in and I said, you'll need to get out and go to the other side because we drive on. I need the steering wheel. And he's, oh, oh, do you like driving on the left or the right better? And I'm going, I find that to be a rather country dependent answer. I'm fine either way. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, you bought at the time, I think I had a, a, a Plymouth. That'll show you how in the 80s they still existed. Uh, you like this better than, than a Ford. And I said, well, this is the one. I could afford, yeah, so we're driving, and, and everything's like that, and later on, we get, we get to my house, and I, I pop on the, the television, the telly, and he goes, do you like American telly better than British telly, and I turned it off, 
And I turned to him and said, Albert, you don't have to have an opinion about everything. And if you have an opinion, you don't have to even tell people. And he looked at me and he goes, do you think that's better than... And I cracked up. Uh, he realized what he'd said later. You don't always have to say what you think. And you always don't have to answer a question. But if you do, speak truthfully. In the old days, I'm told, I don't buy it, by the way. It's very possible. But people love to say things about the old days. And maybe they're true or they're not. You know, back then, we could settle deals with just a handshake. Okay. Be the kind of person that could settle a deal with a handshake. Be the kind of person that says yes and means yes, or no and means no. Still be open to be changed. People to move you from a yes to no or no to yes. Be open for more information. But you don't have to go, yes, I swear, I swear to God, I swear to my mother's grave. You got to believe me. No, no, don't be that person. Be the person that when you say yes or no, that's all it takes. I witnessed a horrific accident a couple of years ago. And I, I waited because I'd witnessed the accident. And the officers came over and said, you're a witness. And I said, yes. And they handed me a form to fill out. and uh, I filled it out. And they looked at me and they said, what did you see? And I told them just very plainly what I saw. And they didn't go back over and grill me or anything. They, the officer just looked at me for a while. And he goes, okay. And walked away. It was because I, I didn't do any hyperbole. I just put down the facts. And I stood there and waited for the police. Gave them my number and said, call me anytime. Give that number to the lawyers. They can call me anytime. And they saw that this is a guy that's just going to go yes and no and not embellish stuff. You know, that's, that's, I'd like to be that guy all the time. Wouldn't you like to be that? That's what he's saying. Be a people that other people can hear and trust. And a people that don't say too much. Can we have a word about that? Let's have a word about that. <clears throat> I'm an introvert. It's hard for you to believe because every time you see me, I'm this personal, talkative little cherub sitting on a stool or walking about the stage. Um... When I'm done doing this, I'm done talking. If I come to visit you on a welcome home tour, we will talk, talk, talk for two or three hours. After that, sometimes people say, come out, we're all going to have dessert. No. Or let's just sit around and, you know, we don't have to talk about anything. No. I need alone. I need to be alone. It's not because I don't like people. Introverts love people as much as extroverts do. It's just that people wear them out. Introverts also are a persecuted minority in church circles. Extroverts will say, you should talk more. You should get out more. You should be around people more. And I always find that fascinating. Because introverts don't go to extroverts and saying, you should talk less. You should stay home more. You should not be around as many people. Doesn't that sound awful? Don't tell your introvert friends that they need to be more like you. Sometimes we should learn from introverts that we don't need to say something now. We can just be quiet now. Jesus said, limit speech. The more you were, use your words, mm. In fact, whenever God breaks in in the book of Job and that dramatic break-in after more than 36 chapters of argument back and forth about God, God enters the argument. And he goes, who is this that darkens counsel by multiplying words? In other words, the more words you guys are saying, the more messed up this is. Who are you that keeps pouring more words on this? There you go. Well, he's going to go again. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. By the way, that was Old Testament law. Why was that Old Testament law? To keep things fair. Think about it. Our own justice system, we've seen protesters do things that other protesters go to prison for. 
But these protesters are more aligned to a political party, so they don't go. And then when the other party comes into power, it's reversed. There are no pure, holy political parties, period. And if you're, this world is your home and you're trying to elect your king, you got a problem. We have a king. His name is Jesus. We need to understand there's dirt enough to spare. But we can see it's unjust. We see one man do this and it's fine. Another man does it. He's put in prison for 20 years. That's wrong. And America has this myth that that's, you know, justice is blind. No, it isn't at all. And we all know it. We see it in the news. We re read it in the papers. Remember papers? Those are fun. We see it on the internet. We see injustices done. The Old Testament didn't allow that to happen. Let's say a rich guy, he's got some even royal titles perhaps, and he is upset by this peasant, he's begging, you know, trying to get, you know, touching my clothes, trying to get something from me, and he hits. Intentionally or not, he destroys a man's eye. The rich guy's eye had to go. It was equal. What if the beggar rushes the the guy, and he's saying, you know, give me alms, give me alms. And while he's waving his hands around, he pokes out the rich, important guy's eye. Well, in every situation you and I know of, the rich and powerful guy can have that guy thrown in prison the rest of his life. He can have him killed. He can, no, loss of an eye. Equal. You could not go beyond. By the way, that is in American law when it comes to self-defense. You slap me I'm not allowed legally to pull a pistol and kill you. I have escalated the force well beyond reasonable force. It is, now, do, do our courts get that right? Often they do not. But that is codified in American law and in English common law. But again, there, the courts don't interpret that well either. So, you know, humans are humans. So when he's saying eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, he is saying, you've heard it said, justice be equal. You hurt me, I hurt you equally. Uh, I, and by the way, many of you right now are thinking that I should bring up the quote by Gandhi, that an eye for an eye, soon will, everybody in the world will be blind. Fact is, there's no proof Gandhi ever said that. So, but it's an interesting quote. I'll give you that. And Jesus would probably nod his head there because we're not to be the people who look for equal justice. That if you harm me, I'm going to harm you back and I'm going to harm you hard. No. He says, do not resist an evil person. Now, we're going to talk about this. Don't, don't, don't get upset yet. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. We don't get that. There's a famous John Wayne movie where he's been told by this person not to, not to do violence. You know, they're a pacifist. He gets slapped and he's told to turn the other cheek. He gets slapped again and he goes, you know, I've run out of cheeks and he punches. And it's a great scene, but that's not what he's talking about here. If somebody shows you disrespect, why the right cheek? To slap your right cheek I have to use my left hand to the Jews and to present day Muslims and to practicing Jews. The left hand is for unclean activities, whether in the toilet, shall we say, or doing anything else, touching something which is unclean is done with the left hand. To slap your right cheek is the greatest form of insult they had hitting you with the unclean hand. He's saying, turn. Let him do that with the clean hand too. Let them face what they are doing. Make them escalate it. Make them see their violation of moral community conduct. So, somebody hurts me, do I hurt him right back? Under most conditions, no. Somebody bumps me in the car, I don't throw it in reverse and ram it and ram their bumper too. No. We can all see how that's going to end poorly, can't we? 
one would hope. I've seen road rage occur and survived it. It wasn't directed at me, but it was going to kill everybody in our area. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are calling 911. I couldn't keep my hands off the wheel, brakes, and uh, the accelerator. I, I had to keep working it just to survive as this, these two battled each other on an interstate. Uh, it was awful. What, why? Somebody cut you off? That was a bad thing. Sorry that happened to you. So you're going to cut them off too? That's not smart. We don't resist because we don't escalate. Somebody writes me and goes, I don't agree with the way that you interpret the Bible. I think you're a sinner going to hell. And I write them back, well, I think you're a sinner going to hell. Have I helped the situation? At all? No. By the way, my normal response when I get a hate mail is not to respond to it anymore. But for most of my life, I just return. I understand. I hear what you say. And while I disagree, I want you to know I'm here for you if you ever need anything. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. Does that mean that always happens? No. Sometimes a soft answer gets your other cheek hit. But he's not hearing here, saying here, no self-defense. Do not protect your family. No, that's not part of scripture. We will get to that as we get to it. Self-defense is allowable. As to what level you want to take it, that is. According to Hebrews, it's if it is possible and as much as it lies with you, live in peace with all men. That sometimes means it isn't possible to be at peace with somebody. And other times, it may be possible for this person to be at peace, but not for you because it doesn't lie within you. Always remember the qualifications. And there are some here. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Why? It is to show them the shame of what they're doing. You took my shirt. Here's my coat, which was the rest of your clothes. Saying, then you may have everything and I will be here naked. And the community will see. Remember, they're talking about a closed community. The community will see how you treat your brother, how you treat your sister. In other words, you'll be shamed, not me, by my nakedness. Everybody there understood this. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Why? To show you're not forcing me. I'm respecting you as a member of my community. The Bible says by doing good to those who do evil to us, we're heaping coals of fire on their head. It is to light up their conscience so that they can see what they're doing to a community member. Give to the one who asks you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. In their law, the Jewish law, you could not charge interest. Uh, that, that was just absolutely forbidden to charge interest. You could charge interest to those outside the community, but not those inside. And so these laws, please remember, are being given to Jewish people to help them see the real meaning and the real force, and the real application of the law. It is not trying to be given to us about every self-defense, every legal battle, every insult. Every, it, that's not what it's talking about. It is talking to a different people in a different time, but what is being given to them should make a difference in the way we do things because this is the will of God in our community. Now, I'm of the opinion that we should treat everybody this way to the best of our ability when it is possible. And I think I can defend that position. But we'll get more to that as we move along. The give to one who asks you, do you think that that means every time anybody asks you, you have to give? No. These are general principles. The Bible also tells us not to encourage the poor in their foolishness. So if we see somebody who is just blowing the money on, on drugs, we don't give them more money. We can take somebody and feed them rather than give them money. If somebody offers to work for money, we let them work and earn the money. 
But there are limits to these things. These are general principles. And I hope you're able to see that. Then we have time for this paragraph too. That's a tough one. <clears throat> You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. That you may look like and act like God. You have any enemies? I can truthfully say I do not. However, I know of many people, not many, I know of some people who consider me their enemy. I'm not. I just disagree with them about this or that. But I've always offered to help and love them. But I don't consider them my enemies at all. Used to. Used to have all the revenge fantasies in your head. Oh, I wish I had a lawsuit against it. I wish I could do this. I wish I don't do that. That's a waste of time. That's playing around with the universe in ways you don't need to play with it. Just live within it. Do the best you can. Be more like God. How about this? You want to be bound? On, let, me, let me bind something here. I'm not binding it on you, okay? Just a general idea I keep in my mind. Be as patient with others as you want God to be with you. Put that on a t-shirt, write that on a sticky note on your car dashboard, wherever it needs to be. Be as patient with others as you want God to be with you. Love your enemy. Why? Because God loves them. I've heard people say all my life, well, love the sinner, but hate the sin. Don't say that. People hate it when they hear that and they're the target of it. Just because you don't like the way they live their life or a decision they've made. Well, I'll love the sinner, but I'll still hate the sin. Let God do all that work. Our job is to love the sinner. Now, it doesn't mean we can even be in the same room with them. You know, if they're a raging maniac and got a sword swinging around, I wouldn't be in the same room with them. We'll love them from a distance. Sometimes you need to love people from a distance because it's too dangerous to love them close up. Dangerous to your person or dangerous to your mental attitude, to your peace. They're a danger to your peace or to the peace of the people you love. Therefore, we keep those people at a distance, but we love them. There's a war going on between Russia and Ukraine. You know all well about that. It's been going for years. I love the participants on both sides. I do not agree with much of this, but I still love the people. And if Vladimir Putin was in my town and got sick, I would volunteer to get the medicine or take him to a hospital. Why? Because he's just so cute and adorable? No. It's because I'm told to love people. Even if that person poses as my enemy, love them. You know why? It's so much easier to love them than hate them. If when you hate them, they consume everything. You wake up in the middle of the night thinking, what I should have said was, and no, just love them and let God take care of all of that. But also we do it because it makes us more like God. That you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. In other words, God pours out gifts on them. So why should you hate them? If you want to be more like God, you won't hate them. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? In the crowd, people going, ooh, tax collectors. He's saying, hey, even they love the people that love them back. What are you doing more than that? How about loving the people that don't love you back? We can do that. I want to live to the place where I, I, I'm known as a person that loves people that don't love me back. I've not always done that. I have, I have written some things and said some things that I will regret the rest of my life, even though God forgave them long ago. And I learned from them, don't say that. Don't write that. Don't be that person. 
And although it was a painful lesson, it was a lesson I needed to learn. And every now and then I need a reminder, and God will remind me, we are the pe- to, to be the people of love. He goes, if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? <laughs> if you don't know this, if you're watching outside of America or in one of those little enclaves of America where these things don't happen, uh, this may shock you. But in America, people will look at you in the eye and say hello, even if you're a stranger. They will wave at you as they're driving by. Not all the time. In the South, a lot of the time, they'll wave to each other on the road. They'll acknowledge each other. They'll, because that's the, that's the tradition. Well, uh, I've known some people that moved to the South from Northern climes, shall we say, that are just blown away. Why are these people waving at me? Why are people saying hi to me? Saying, well, that's just the way we do. God says, take that outside of your own people and greet others. Be kind to others. Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Okay, that seems to be asking a lot. The word perfect there does not mean without error, even though God is without error. The word perfect is a much harder word to translate And the NIV guys basically just didn't even try here. Most versions, they don't even try. It more means more aware of who you are and who you are supposed to be, regardless of the situation. You see why they don't try to translate it? It more means remember who you are and who you're supposed to be in every situation. Think of the word meek. When we think of the word meek, we think of somebody weak, timid. Uh, Perhaps uh, in the old movie days, uh, Don Knotts character. No, the Bible says Moses was the meekest mere man that ever lived. Moses? He killed a guy defending people, but he killed a guy. He led battles, famously lost his temper with his people many times. But Moses remembered who he was and who God was. Meekness is sometimes referred to as power under authority. So powerful, be powerful, but remember you are under authority. You're a soldier under orders. And therefore, obey your orders. Be like God because God has called you to be like him. So it is a big ask. I'll grant you that. But God hasn't asked us to be nothing other than adequate. He's called us to do great things because we believe in him. Next week, we'll have a look at chapter 6 when he talks a little bit more about the giving and talks a little bit more about the public display of righteousness. We might need a refresher on those things. So I'll see you next week. Thank you for supporting us. Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell. It matters. It spreads us to other people. And it has us then show up on their search pages whenever they search. We have, uh, as this is being recorded, we have 4,200 subscribers. Every hundred beyond that reaches hundreds more. So please like, subscribe, hit the bell. We'll see you next week. God bless.